at my uh, great grandfather was killed by the Indians up in North Dakota mm -hmm. and scalped, and my grandfather fought Indians. And there used to be some of the old Indians my grandfather had fought used to come around and visit him. And they'd sit down out in the lawn and talk over the old days, you know, and, and uh, drink a lot of coffee and tea, loaded half full of sugar. And, uh, but after, he, after my grandfather died, they never came back again. Mm -hmm. They stayed away from there, and that's why I missed them very much, because I, I enjoyed having them come. But I grew up in stories like that. And, I was working with a man who had been raised with the Indians, and so I learned a great deal from him. And uh, then I left there and went over to New Mexico and we baled hay for a while. And on that job, there was a man working, he used to ride with Billy the Kid. And uh, Billy the Kid and two of his pals were buried right across the road where we were baling hay one day. And I commented on it, was talking about it a little bit, and one of the fellows said, well, gee, for him, said, and him, talked to old Tom, he used to ride with him. And he isn't some guy who said, I rode with Billy the Kid. He's a guy who's on record that ridden with him. Yeah. yeah, he'd been in jail with him. He'd been wounded in gun battles, but it was also been. He fought in both the Lincoln County War and the Town of Basin War, which was later over in Arizona. And he's been a rough boy in his day. He only had one leg at the time I talked to him, a wooden leg. But uh, he taught me a lot about the West and about gunfighters and about outlaws. The main thing I wanted to do was, was see the country. And I used to do a little boxing, too, because nearly every town had, a, had some fellow who thought he was a fighter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he was. <laughs> but uh, many times he just thought he was. And I'd come in town and get acquainted around, and they'd arrange a match between the two of us, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, then I went on over to, I got to bailing hay over there in, uh, in Fort Sumner, New Mexico. And um, they had a fighter there in town who was supposed to be very good. So somebody talked up a fight between the two of us. And then at the last minute, he backed out. He had always uh, fought fellows he knew he could beat. And uh, he didn't know about me, because I was a strange stranger. So he backed out of the fight. And they went up on, on what they call the Cap Rock uh, and got a fellow who used to fight in the Navy up there. To come, his name was Joe May. They got him to come down and fight me. Well, he outweighed me 35 pounds. And he was a pretty tough boy. Um, so uh, we fought a six-round draw. Actually, I could have knocked him out, but he was heavier than I was and, and pretty strong and older than I was, of course, so I was very wary. Mm -hmm. I was very cautious about it, and uh, I boxed along very carefully, taking care of myself and just putting on a good fight until the fifth round. And uh, uh, he hit me a good, solid punch and shook me up considerably. So uh, I went to work then. And um, when the fight ended in sixth round, I had him hanging the ropes out on his feet. Usually, I had no trouble getting somebody to fight me because I, I didn't look like a fighter. Other fighters always knew I was a fighter, but the average guy didn't. I didn't have any cauliflower ears. I didn't have a broken nose. And so uh, there were a lot of guys willing to, willing to try me. I fought 59 fights, and I lost five, 34 knockouts. And um, I never lost a fight, and I was eating regularly. I always wanted to tell stories. All my life I wanted to write. Most of my first stories were about Indonesia and China, some about South Latin America, places like that. I wrote a whole string of stories about a, a character named Ponga Jim Mayo, who was the um, captain of a tramp freighter in the East Indies just before World War II. And um, I had spent a year down there, knew the country very well. And so I was having a ball writing about him. It, it's tough getting started writing. And uh, because you see, there really is no place to begin. From the day you start trying to sell a story, you're competing with the best people who sell stories, mm -hmm. you know. So actually, you've got to be good right at the start. You've got to have developed some talent for it. I've written 87 novels. And most of them are about the West, not all of them. And um, of the short stories I've written, I don't know how many are about the West. 
I would suggest 70 or 80 anyway. And um, possibly more, possibly more than 100. <clears throat> but uh, the West always intrigued me, you know, and, and uh, I really didn't get turned in on the West till after World War II. I came back from overseas, and like everybody else who came back from the Army, I had to start over again. The night I got out of the Army was January 6, 1946. And um, I was invited to a party over in Manhattan by one of the editors I knew. And there were a lot of writing people there and a lot of editors there. And one of them asked me what I was going to do, and I said, well, i got to get started writing. He said, well, look, I've talked to you about the West, and you know a lot about it. Why don't you write some Westerns for me? I need them in the worst way. So um, I did. And they caught on and began to go. And then I invented this character, Chick Beaudry, a Texas Ranger. And I wrote about uh, 25 or six stories about him. I had never thought of myself as a Western writer. I had never planned to write anything about the West. But suddenly, I had a bestseller in my hands. I had a book that really had taken off. and. Um, so I had to make a decision. <clears throat> well, I knew in the first place, if you write westerns, you write behind the eight ball. Nobody considers them literature. That's the first thing. The second place is, if you start writing from paperbacks, as I was going to do, that also puts you behind the eight ball, because in those days, paperbacks were considered the end of the road. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I thought about it, and I made up my mind. I was going to do it. I was going to take the ball and run with it, and I was going to make them like it. I was going to succeed as a Western writer. I was going to make the Western writer literature. I was going to make it important, regardless of what they thought about it. In the first place, I have an enormous background of, of personal experience in the West. And then I have a, <clears throat> an equal background in, in listening to the old timers talk, which is a big help. So I have a place to start off from. Uh, then I, I study an area very thoroughly. Uh, it, usually I'm familiar with it on the ground. I've been there. Uh, if not, I go back. And sometimes I go back anyway and look it over again. But also, uh, I do research in the original documents. I try to find diaries of people who lived at the area at the time. And many of my stories come out of the diaries. I also um, read the newspapers that were published at the time. I literally saturate myself in the period and the time. I don't think I have... Uh, uh, created any any myths or anything or any any falsehoods at least about the West. The story that I tell is, is a true story. Uh, somebody else might write a, a similar story at the same period, same time, and see it through different eyes. But um, you see, the, <clears throat> there was something else going on that's quite important that a lot of people don't realize. That is that a great many of the young men who came West, who became cowboys, and all the cowboys were not illiterate people at all. A lot of them were very intelligent men. A lot of them came from England, came from other parts of the world over here. They all wanted to get that romantic, exciting life of a cowboy. Well, actually, it was brutally hard work, uh, <clears throat> 16 to 18 hours a day on the whole. And, uh, uh, but they loved it, because they were a man on horseback. They were doing something. They were out there in the open air. They were riding, a lot of freedom connected with it. <clears throat> but the thing is that 9 out of 10 of those young men who came either from Europe or from the East out to the West, had been reading dime novels, and they'd been reading romantic stories. So they came out there already geared to find something. And they found it, whether it was there or not. This was the way they saw it. Now, many of the old dry-as-dust cowboys were, oh, that's all nonsense. But it wasn't. And you can see it in their own lives when they begin telling you about it. Aside from my work, which is one of my favorite pastimes, I love to write, I love to read. But aside from that, I like to go back to the mountains. I like to spend time in really wild country, mountains or desert. And uh, one of my favorite quotations that expresses it very, very well is from Robinson Jeffers. And uh, he said, when the cities lie at the monster's feet, there's still the mountains. And uh, I believe that very much. When there's corruption, there's crime, there's all these things in the cities, and all this turbulence, and all this confusion, and everything, you can back up to the mountains, you can walk out there alone, and there's a great stillness around you, and you can look out across great vistas at far distant peaks and mountains and, and clouds and everything, and, and suddenly uh, it smooths out all the wrinkles, and you're at peace with the world. It, it gives you something, refreshes your whole spirit, makes you stronger, makes you a better person. There's no question about it at all, and, and I, uh, I like to go back to the mountains. 
I like to go back and, and uh, feel that feeling and know how it was. <laughs> <laughs>